And I want for us to study today the matter of what the New Testament actually authorizes or teaches concerning that. Remembering that this morning we simply consulted uh, sacred history, what the Bible records, specifically the New Testament, and then we noticed secular history. In this sermon, then, we will study the arguments for the exclusive use of singing in the worship of the Lord's church. We must know why we worship God in singing and singing only. Each member of the church should be able to comprehend and therefore be able to teach others the very reasons why Christians sing in the worship to God and why we do not use mechanical instruments or any other kind of music but the singing as it is taught in the New Testament in the worship of God. So we intend in this sermon to conclusively prove that singing is the exclusive type of music in the worship of God that Jesus authorizes. I would like to go back to one of the passages we used this morning, and that is Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19, where Paul wrote, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. The kind, and I keep saying kind because of different kinds of music. The kind of music the church has is certainly an important matter in the religious environment around about us. It may be just something people do because they've always done it. And if that's all the reason they have for doing it, they really are not prepared to give a proper reason, as the Bible instructs, for us to do it. The situation that exists today within Churches of Christ, that music has been a cappella, singing, in the very nature of that kind of music. We have, as I said this morning, taught that it was sinful to use mechanical instruments of God in worship. However, there are some Churches of Christ today that teach that the Mechanical instrument of music or singing, whichever they would say it, uh, is just an optional thing. Take it or leave it. Other churches have adopted the mechanical instrument for some of their worship services. And we need to ask then, is this just something we've handed down without any concern for Bible authority for what we've done? And because we do it so much, it's peculiar to us that we just like it. Now, the people who are departing from the New Testament divine pattern have tried to say that for years now. It's just our tradition. Well, is that the case? Is the instrument, as we have defined it, an issue of fellowship or an optional thing? Well, it's our contention, based upon the teaching of the Bible, that it is a matter of fellowship. And I ask you simply to remember, those that were here, what we studied last Sunday morning on righteousness, basically meaning correct living, and specifically as it relates to our relationship to God. Those things that are obligatory by nature, they must be done to be saved, they must be done to remain faithful, are those things that are matters of fellowship. And we ought to understand that. We have to then learn how the Bible authorizes and how the New Testament is a document that does authorize. It expresses the will of King Jesus. It's just that way. For people to say that the New Testament is not an authoritative document, that it's not doctrine, that it's not a pattern, an inspired pattern, an infallible pattern, whereby we are to measure what is right and wrong in God's sight, uh, raises this question. If it's not that, then what is it? Is it a book of suggestions? God would rather have to do it this way, and so he expresses his opinion. But if we want to do it some other way, that's all right. Well, you see what that does to the authoritativeness of the Bible when you take such a position as that. So I'd like for us to discuss the various um, different facets of this, of this issue. 
I've already said that we have looked at music, and as we, those that were here, know that we did this morning from the historical perspective. And I remind you again that we saw that as far as sacred history is concerned, then all of the scriptures in the New Testament pertaining to singing as worship, or pertaining to singing, period, is just that, singing. Not one word did we find within sacred history regarding the use of mechanical instruments of music or any other kind of music other than a cappella or singing. We saw in that in secular history that mechanical instruments of music were condemned by the church up to around the 6th century A.D. when Pope Vitalian I introduced them into the worship of what was already the Roman Catholic Church. By this time, other departures from New Testament doctrine had taken place, and out of that apostasy, as I said, the Roman Catholic Church developed. And again, as we noticed this morning, even though it was introduced hundreds and hundreds of years past because, before it became the acceptable way even among the churches for doing that. So we concluded that it's only been in popular use within the religious world for a period of about 200 or so years. I say popular use. Even the Reformation leaders did not condone it. Well, what about today? Well, again, I say we want to know what the Lord in His infallible Word has authorized regarding worship and specifically singing in worship. And so I simply set out the first argument, which is what I call the argument from faith. The argument for singing in the worship of God and only singing in the worship of God. All actions of faith are actions that only come from hearing God's Word. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. Therefore my confidence, my trust, my belief in God must come from what the New Testament teaches. The action of worshiping with a cappella or of worshiping with singing is an action that comes from hearing the instruction of God's Word. Thus, my conclusion is that the action of worshiping with uh, singing is an action of faith. You remember that I've said many times that if we say, well, I believe this is right in religion, then we ought to be able to say, I believe the New Testament teaches thus and so. We would do well in the church to understand that today belief sometimes just means, well, I think that's the way it is. It also can mean, I believe the Bible teaches it. But in the Bible, speaking as the oracles of God, to say I believe something means, since faith comes by hearing the word of God, I know the Bible teaches it. So when we make these statements that it is a, a matter of faith or the faith argument as I referred to it, then we're saying the New Testament teaches this. And so I read to you this morning every passage in the New Testament regarding music, and it was singing, 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 singing. Now, since faith comes by hearing the Word of God, and we're talking about the music whereby God is worshipped and He is pleased with it, then would you conclude any other kind of music is authorized? When you've read everything the New Testament has to say on it, and listen, that's everything the Lord has to say on it. Somebody says, well, I had a dream. Well, good. Stay with your dreams. Or I feel this way or the other. Fine, feel that way or the other. But don't tell me it's the Lord's will because I can find somebody else having dreams or feeling right the opposite direction. The argument as stated against, against mechanical instrumental music is this. We must establish that the mechanical instrument is not an action of faith. Remember, faith comes from hearing the Word of God. If singing is acceptable to God, then the New Testament authorizes it, teaches it. Okay, all actions of faith are actions that only come from hearing God's Word, Romans 10, 17. The action of worshiping with the mechanical instrument is an action that does not come from hearing God's Word. What's our conclusion? Therefore, the action of worshiping with mechanical instruments of music is not an action of faith. 
Now, the premises are true and the syllogism valid, and you can't get over it if you accept the truth of the New Testament, the authority of Jesus Christ. That's what the Lord said. Now we must establish that the mechanical instrument cannot, that is in worship to God, in music, it cannot please God. All actions that are not actions of faith, listen, are actions that cannot please God. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he is rewarder of them that diligently seek after him. Hebrews eleven six. So then faith cometh by hearing the word of God. All right. The action of worshiping with the mechanical instrument is not an action of faith. Why? Read the will of Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. Read the will of Christ who has not some or most but all authority in the very words he wrote that he calls the perfect or complete law of liberty. And you'll find only singing. Therefore, the action of worshiping with a mechanical instrument of music or any other kind of music that is not singing cannot please God. Now, let's go from the argument of our uh, go to the argument of authority. You all know what Paul wrote in Colossians 3.17 and as part of the New Testament of the Christ as he wrote to the church in Colossae. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. So Jesus must authorize our deeds. All our deeds. We are people of the book. We act under the orders of our King. This includes, of course, the worship of the Lord's church. If you look at Ephesians 1.22, Colossians 1.18, and Ephesians 5.23, I say again, those passages explicitly teach that Jesus is the head of the church. He is the controller. He has the final say-so. Now, the argument for singing only in the music whereby God is worshipped is this. All divinely approved actions of worship within the church are actions that are authorized by the head of the church, Jesus the Christ. The action of worshiping with singing in the church is a divinely approved action of worship within the the Lord's church. Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, 16. Now watch our conclusion. The action of worshiping with singing in the church is an action that is authorized by the head of the church, Jesus Christ. Well, all right. What about the argument that is against mechanical instruments of music in the worship? All divinely approved actions of worship within the church are actions that are authorized by the head of the church, Jesus Christ. The action of worshiping with mechanical instruments of music is not, is not an action that has been authorized by the head of the church, Jesus. Therefore, the action of worshiping with mechanical instrumental music is not a divinely approved action of worship within the church. Now, if somebody wants to oppose these arguments, how are you going to do it? Here's one thing you can do. You can say, I just don't believe it. <laughs> but you're not believing it doesn't mean the Bible doesn't teach it. You can disbelieve what the Bible teaches. But I don't know why you want to mess around with Jesus Christ if you're going to disbelieve what his last will and testament teaches. So as the Lord put it to the Jews, why well, call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say. Then there's the argument from, we'll call it restoration of the divine pattern. You all remember that in the parable of the soils, uh, Luke 8, 11, the seed is the Word of God. Now think about what a seed is in nature. The life element in that seed has all of the DNA pattern. It has everything that's going to make the plant that comes from that seed just what it is and just what the parent plant was and all the way back. It's a blueprint. The seed is a blueprint. 
It's a pattern. It's a code for restoration. Of the offspring, addition to that pattern will destroy the ability to restore the offspring. Subtraction from that pattern will destroy the ability to create the offspring. Now, if you don't want to have the actual offspring, then just corrupt the seed. But in the case of the kingdom, the seed's the word of God. If you don't want to have the offspring from the seed that just comes from the pure, unadulterated word, then just corrupt the word. Add to it. Or subtract from it. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13, Paul told the young preacher Timothy, Hold the form, the American Standard says the pattern, Hold the form or pattern of sound words, wholesome doctrine, which thou hast heard from me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Now what does he mean? Stay with the truth and note you dare add to it or take away from it or alter it in any form. Preach the word. Be in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. As Christians, then, to be faithful to our Lord, to live up to the name we wear, Christians, one who is of Christ, we must hold to that pattern. We must be steadfast and unmovable with it. We must never modify, alter it, or abandon it in any way. The argument for singing in the worship of the church. One, acts or avenues of worship that are included within the New Testament pattern or doctrine are items that we may restore in the worship of God. Singing in the church as worship to God is an item of worship. Let me just rephrase it to make it more specific. Singing in the church is an item of worship that is included within the New Testament pattern for worship. Now, what's our conclusion? Singing in the church is an act or avenue of worship that we may restore and worship God. Now, I often tell you all when you're thinking through something and the true meaning of thinking, you ought to use true false statements. Well, let me show you how each one of these is either true or false statement. Watch. What would you do to this? Let's go back over it again. True or false. All acts or avenues of worship that are included within the New Testament pattern or doctrine are items that we may restore in the worship to God. Well, you're going to say false. If you're going to say false, what are you going to include in the worship to God? So see, when you say false, you have to then think, all right, that's untrue. If it's untrue, then I can't abide by it. All right, what am I going to do? How do I determine what's acceptable to God in the worship of God? Well, take this. Singing in the church is an item of worship that is included within the New Testament pattern for worship. All right. Now, if I say false, where does that put me? What does that do? If I say that the singing is not an item of worship in the doctrine or pattern of Christ, it throws me into all sorts of things. How do I know what is? truth of the matter is, you don't know. You just do as you please and hope God likes it. <laughs> then we conclude singing in the church is an act of worship or avenue of worship that we may restore in the worship of God. Now you add true to every one of those, it works out just fine. Because you read everything the New Testament, the will of Christ, says as to worship of God in music and it's sing, 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 sing. As you say, well, what all does the Bible have to say about worshiping God in music? And I can say, sing, 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 sing. Okay, but I don't sing only. I use some other kind of music, organ, piano, orchestra, brass band, humming, stomping, clapping. And I say, well, how do you know the Lord likes that? And what are you going to answer? You can't go to the New Testament. We've read every scripture in the New Testament that pertains to the music whereby God is worshipped. And it's, guess what? Sing, 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 sing. Yeah, but we do sing. We just add this to it. Where's your authority to add it to it? Well, we just like it, and I really don't see there's nothing bigger to do about it. How is it that you can take that attitude about it and know God's happy with such an attitude? 
And are you willing to take that same attitude about everything else when it comes to the church? What about who is acceptable to God? On the way home today at noon, I saw a bumper sticker. It had a Star of David. It had a cross. It had the yin and the yang uh, on their sign. It had, uh, of all things, it had the uh, Muslim half moon or quarter moon or whatever it is. It went on the toilet long years ago. And uh, all of that. I had it all on that one thing. I thought, now, that person thinks they're being very beneficent, very loving, and extending great toleration to everybody. Well, here's one of those, two of those religions at least. There's more than that. But I'm thinking of Judaism, and I'm thinking of, uh, of the Muslims. Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. But the Christians say, He's the only Savior, and He is the Son of God. But they're all in harmony. Folks, that's our nation today. That's what's wrong with us. Nobody believes anything has to be this way. It can't be any other way. And if you hold to something like this, and you say, ah, oh, you're just whatever. Well, you might ask them, why do you believe it about me? Truth of the matter is, they won't discuss it with you when you get that close. <laughs> or else they've truly been persuaded, they think they're right, and they need to have those contradictions pointed out to get the thinkery working right again. Now, let's look for a moment at the, we'll call it the New Covenant argument. Let me go back up first for the, the, the argument against mechanical instrumental music in the church's worship. The argument against mechanical instrumental music in the church's worship. All acts or avenues of worship that are not included within the New Testament pattern for worship are, ad, are, are items that we may not restore in worship to God. Now, if you say, well, we can restore them anyway. Restore means they were already there first. And we're going back to the original standard of truth and putting it back in. Mechanical instrumental music in the church is an act or avenue of worship that is not included within the New Testament pattern for worship. Now, can I know that? Yes. How do I know it? I study my New Testament. I read every single solitary word of it. And we find only sing, sing, sing. Mechanical instrumental music is an act of, or avenue that we may not restore to the worship of God, and that's absolutely true, because you can't restore what was not there in the first place. You tell somebody, well, I'm going to restore this table. And you say, well, let me see the table you're going to restore. Well, it's, there's, there's no such table, but I'm going to restore it. You know, people like that need to be put in padded rooms. Or evidently elected uh, president. Uh, the New Covenant argument. The New Covenant argument. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 15 reads. And for this cause he is the mediator. That's Christ of the New Testament. That by means of death. For the redemption of the transgressions. That were under the first testament. They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now this is the argument for singing only in the worship of God. All actions for which Jesus mediates are actions that are part of the New Covenant. Now, if you say, well, I don't think that's so. Well, then why wouldn't you? How are you going to determine what is and what's not a part of it? The action of singing in the worship of a Christian in the church of Christ is an action for which Jesus mediates. Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3:16. You say, how do you know that? I can read and I can understand what I read. And I read every passage in the New Testament, and it says, sing, sing, sing. Conclusion, the action of singing in the worship of God by, by a Christian in the church of Christ is an action that is part of the New Covenant. Well, the argument against mechanical instrumental music and the worship of Christians in the church. All actions for which Jesus mediates are actions that are part of the New Covenant. Now, think about what a mediate. What a mediator does. Listen now to the what we call the minor premise. The action of mechanical instrumental music and the worship of Christians in the church of Christ is an action that is not part of the new covenant. Well, how do I know that? I read. I understand. I read everything in the New Testament pertaining to music. And it says, sing, sing, sing. Therefore, the action of using mechanical instrumental music in the worship of Christians in the church of Christ is not an action 
for which Jesus mediates. In other words, he mediates on the basis of his authoritative word. He doesn't mediate on the basis of the Book of Mormon. He doesn't mediate on the basis of the Baptist manual. He mediates on the basis of the meaning of the words in the New Testament, his last one and testament of Christ. Had a, I guess about two weeks ago, a question come from somebody out east, some state up in that direction. And the fellow saying, what is the best way for me to oppose special music, standing up and, and singing solos in the church as worship? Brethren, it's the same thing. I, I pointed out to him, I said, just notice what the New Testament authorizes. And if that's not authorized as worship to God, then oppose it just like you would a big organ <laughs> or a piano or anything else not authorized in the Bible. The will of Jesus expressed in the words of Christ. John 12, 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, these same shall judge him the last day. Now what do we have in the New Testament? The words he's spoken. It's the inspired New Testament of the Christ. His words final on the matter. So it's just a matter of any time somebody comes along and says, Well, I think we ought to, what is this? Nestle Pure Life Water. I think we ought to use that in the observance of the Lord's Supper in the place of the fruit of the vine. Okay, let's do it. But first of all, show me where Jesus, as the head of the church, and he who has all authority in his last will and testament, authorizes such a thing in the Lord's Supper. Well, you're not going to find it. It's just not there. Why do we use just the fruit of the vine and unleavened bread in the Lord's Supper? For the same reason we only use singing. That's all that the New Testament has to say on the matter. And that, when it says it, is the authorization for us to act. That's, that's just that the way it is. Now, let's look at what we'll call the argument from silence. Many state that the argument against mechanical and instrumental music is just an argument from silence, and they claim that it's not a very strong argument. But now we see the argument from silence used by the inspired writer of the Hebrews, thus the Holy Spirit used it. And I want to show you some things on this. It'll take just a little bit. Go to the very first chapter of Hebrews, and let me read to you verses 5 through 7. Hebrews 1, 5 through 7. Now think of this letter being first written and coming to the Hebrews as being read before the whole audience. And you're thinking with it, you're wanting to understand it, you're noticing the meaning of the words as they apply to you. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh these angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? Now what is he saying? He's saying, God never said what he said about Christ to an angel. God was silent on the matter. When he did speak, he spoke as regarding Jesus Christ of Nazareth when it came to this. Well, there's one. Look over in verse 13 of this same chapter. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Now, he's asking these people, saying, Where did you ever learn from God's word that he did this with an angel? And they'd have to say, Silence. <laughs> Who's silent? God's silence. God never said any such thing like that. And the inspired writer, inspired of the Holy Spirit, God's writing it through the inspired penman, is saying, if you didn't hear anything like that about angels, why are you believing it? It's that simple. So it shows you that authority is established by what he said, not by what is not said. But let's go a little further. Look in chapter 2 and verse number 5. For unto the angels hath he not put, notice for. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection 
the world to come whereof we speak. What's he saying? Have you ever read anywhere in the Bible? It said this way. Where in the scriptures does he say that he's put angels in that position? And then have to answer, we've never read such a thing as that. Well, then why do you believe it? Why do you teach it? Well, going further, look at verse 4, or rather chapter 4 and verse 7. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Same approach. If you look in chapter 7 and verse 14, For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Now, if you read all the way through that chapter, even the next chapter, it's all based on the fact of why would you think anybody but Jesus Christ of Nazareth would be who he is? Because Moses spake nothing of him being a priest, for if he did, he'd have to be at the tribe of Levi. It just won't work. All of these are examples of saying... You didn't hear anything from God about this. Why do you believe it's so? Which says you have to hear from God about it in order to believe it and to be acceptable to God. I guess it's sort of like the old spiritual says, if it's good enough for the Holy Spirit, then it's good enough for me. It ought to be that way with us. This one does not apply, though, to singing. Well, why doesn't it apply to singing? Because the scriptures are not silent on that kind of music. So when somebody says, it's just an argument from silent, I don't know where they come up with such a thing. Because we've read every scripture in the New Testament pertaining to music and worship to God, and it was sing, sing, sing every time. So we noted those passages this morning. The argument against mechanical instrumental music and the worship of Christians in the church is this. All actions about which the Bible is silent are actions about which we have no scriptural right to employ in worship. The Bible is silent regarding the action of using mechanical instrumental music to worship God by. Therefore, we have no scriptural right to use mechanical instrumental music in the worship of God. Now you say, well, I just don't accept that. Well, that's all you can say. Because you, can't tell me, you can't tell me why if you believe the Bible to be authoritative in the will of Christ, why that you won't follow it. You just have to say, I don't accept it. The specification, the specification of the instrument argument, we'll call it, if you look at Ephesians 5, 19 and Colossians 3 and verse 16, you see that both verses specify the, the instrument that we are to use in worshiping God. Both of them do. And let me pause here and, and say this. We should not say we do not believe in instrumental music unless we've already defined that term to mean mechanical instrumental music. Because I believe in instrumental music. The very instrument that is set out in Ephesians 5, 19 and Colossians 3, 16. And it is the heart. The soloing is soloing done in the heart as the heart strings are plucked. And that's the idea. And in fact, back in 1922, Brother Hardiman shut down the Christian church when he debated Boswell in Nashville, Tennessee. And they never did get over it when he pointed out that even though you look in the history of the etymology of the word solo and it's meant different things to pluck, to twang and so forth. And they thought, well, see, inherent in the word is the idea of playing on a mechanical instrument of music. So in the word itself, it's authorized. Brother Hardiman, being the grammarian that he was, simply pointed out to them, it says that something is plucked. But that's like saying I baptize. Well, baptize water who? You don't know just by saying I baptize. But here you know it's the heart that's being plucked. It's the inward man that's in tune and playing with God. And by the way, this morning, I believe it's Martin Luther. I can't remember which one. That's the idea, Luther or Calvin. That's the idea behind what he was saying. To use any other instrument is to supplant the instrument that God has told us to use. The argument from specific authority is clear, and we do it all the time when it comes to Noah. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. That specifies. That limits the kind of wood God would allow Noah to use. Whatever gopher wood, whether we know what it was or not, Noah did. 
And God knew how to communicate what wood he wanted the ark to be built out of. So he said, go for wood. That's specificity. Now, I've often used this. You've heard me. Uh, you have restrooms back here. It says men or something on this one and ladies over here. Now, I tell you, that authorizes somebody to use this restroom over here, and it authorizes somebody to use this one over here. Now, do you want to learn the law of specifics and generics? Then you women just go parading into the men's bathroom. Or the men just parade into the women's bathroom, and you will know what the law of exclusion is. Because you have entered into a place you were not, by specificity, authorized to go into. And we use it every day. And yet something is as tremendous and important as the worship of God, we claim we can't understand it, but we can know where to go to the bathroom. Now, what does that tell you about people's prejudices against the words and their meanings? Going further. Let's look at this, and we'll call it the righteousness of one's own argument. The righteousness of one's own argument. Romans 10, 3, we used this, something like it last week. For they, being ignorant of God, speaking of the Jews, righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Well, listen to Philippians 3, 9. And we, and, and be found in Him, that is, we Christians be found in Christ, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Now, these passages teach us that when we substitute our own righteousness for God's righteousness, then we do not please God. God's righteousness is revealed within the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's power to save us. Listen to verse 17 following verse 16. For therein is the, that is the gospel. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, if it's not within the gospel, then it's not according to God's righteousness, and we are making a righteousness of our own. The argument for singing then, that is in worship of the church, all worship that is from a righteousness of our own is worship that is not revealed within the gospel. Singing is worship that has been revealed within the gospel of Christ. Therefore, singing is worship that is not a righteousness of of our own. It's a matter of faith. The argument against mechanical instrumental music in the worship of God is this. All worship which is according to the righteousness of God is worship that has been revealed to us in the gospel. Worship with mechanical instrumental music has not been revealed to us within the gospel. Therefore, worship with mechanical instrumental music is not according to the righteousness of God. We have conclusively demonstrated two things. One, God is pleased with singing in the worship of the church and singing only. It's according to faith. It is authorized. It is a part of the pattern preserved for restoration. It's a part of the New Testament or New Covenant of Christ. God is not silent on the use of this type of music. God has specified the uh, instrument of the heart to accompany singing. And singing is according to the righteousness of God. Number two, God has not pleased, God is not pleased with singing in the worship of God accompanied by mechanical instrumental music, another kind of music because it is not according to faith. It is not authorized by the New Testament. It is not part of the pattern that was preserved for restoration. It's not part of the New Covenant. God is silent on the use of mechanical instrument music in the worship of God. God has not specified the mechanical instrument to accompany singing. And mechanical instrumental music in the worship of God is not according to the righteousness of God. Now, folks, that's ungetoverable. And wouldn't you like to get up here and show where I'm wrong? But... And by the way, this reason there's not much debating done anymore. <laughs> but if somebody wants to say you're wrong, they've got to show where I was wrong in this reason. And my misuse of the scriptures and the conclusions that I've, that I've drawn from this. 
Brethren, this is the way that we need to deal with people. This is the way we need to deal with arguments. This is the way we learn to do what we do, the way we do it, for the reason we do it. This is how we know what's obligatory and what is not. And this is studying the Bible so that we can practice today only what the Lord's authorized us to do. This is the way you get ready to stand before Jesus in the judgment so that you can hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. I hope we set it out in a way that if you really listen, that you'll know what you need to do on any subject. Notice I just use mechanical instrumental music or singing on this. But anything, whereas the church, the worship of the church, the organization of the church, any avenue or act of worship, anything you do in your day-to-day -day Christian living, whether it's marriage, Divorce and remarriage, it all comes down to this. Did my Lord in the meaning of the words of his New Testament authorize this thing to be? Or did he actually forbid it? Now, if he forbade it and he didn't authorize it, what business do I do doing it? <laughs> what business do I have doing it and saying, well, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christ. I'm under the head of the church who purchased the church with his blood. I'm redeemed by his blood. Well, I really can't explain to you why I do this except I like it real well. That's what set the Lord's church apart from every other religious institution on this earth. And when we break down on this right here, we might as well close the doors, sell the land and the house and whatever you can get out of it, divide up the money, and so we'll be glad for that, and then go on and eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you die. When we give up the authority of the Bible for what we believe and practice, we give up God, we give up Christ, we give up our salvation. And we have nothing to offer the world that the world doesn't already have. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation to become a Christian, know that we set out before you the New Testament authorized plan of salvation. That you must hear the gospel on the basis of that gospel. Believe in Christ. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Him. And be baptized for the remission of sins. As a child of God, if your life is not being run by the authority of Christ, you need to ask yourself the question, how can I be faithful? If there's not a thus saith the Lord for what I believe and practice in my everyday life. If you brought reproach on the church by public sins, we urge you to repent of them and make them right as publicly as they were committed. And if they were private, then God and you by yourselves, according to the teaching of the New Testament, can make it right by asking His forgiveness. So if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.